Hi everyone, I'm uh, thrilled to be here and to be talking to all of you about uh, what is really one of my favorite topics, which is the importance of the digital and the digital transformation and having the digital strategy. I mean, really for any organization and especially for uh, nonprofits and charities um, in Canada and beyond. And the reason we call this Beyond Fundraising is that we used to talk about online fundraising and kind of, uh, you know, the online donor acquisition and retention and really dealing with the new reality of so much of our lives being transitioned onto the online. But in the last several years, this larger notion of, you know, digital transformation or more holistic approach to, um, you know, new opportunities that are presented in the digital technologies that are emerging or uh, converging or the new ones has really taken hold in both the, certainly in the for-profit uh, industries as well as in the charitable space. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that because I definitely feel very strongly and also as someone who has gone through, uh, you know, significant disruption through technology in my previous roles uh, in the for-profit sector, that it is important to really take it out of, of just thinking about this as a fundraising uh, fundraising kind of uh, issue, which certainly is a, is a huge part of it, but it has a larger implications for, uh, for organizations and for the future sustainability of really any organization because simply the technologies and the opportunities that they present and the way the world is changing is, is, is about so much more. And so for the goals of this webinar, we wanted to talk very briefly about trends that are, affect, that are affecting us all today and I'm not going to spend tons of time on that because this is a huge, uh, it's a huge deck and I'm actually not going to even go over each slide. You guys will get uh, the deck in its entirety after this, the webinar. But I want to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, what digital transformation is and what it is not. And I really feel that it's important to understand that because at least for me, and certainly I, I feel in my experience that how you approach something and how you think about something at the outset really does affect uh, the final result. And so there is, the, I mean, digital, digital transformation is one of, you know, those phrases that has become a bit kind of buzzy, but nevertheless, it's, um, it's a very important concept. And then we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, what can you do and how you can start thinking about where you're at in your organization and what are some of the next steps that you need to do. Um, I have to say this at the outset because I think often people come to me and, um, you know, there is no silver bullet, like there is no easy formula that I can share with everyone today and say, okay, if you do this A, B, and C, you will win. I mean, unfortunately, it's a little bit more complex, it's a little bit more ongoing, but I think it's not to be discouraged though, because I think it's very important and there is like a huge upside at the end of this process or as this process kind of takes hold. And then we'll talk a little bit about, um, you know, what can, can you do to, to kind of get going with this. So in terms of the trends, again, I'm not going to really dwell on this because I assume that most of us well know that there is a huge disruption happening all around. Um, I read in the World Economic Forum report uh, the other week that they're actually calling this, the time that we live in now the fourth industrial revolution. And I said to myself, oh my God, I thought the digital revolution is still going on. So apparently we have transitioned into something even more complex with like more kind of interesting, you know, innovations and blurring of the lines between the physical, the digital, huge like biological spheres uh, following, following uh, the last few decades of, you know, the emergence of different platforms and networks and information technology um, um, and electronics. And, you know, we're all familiar with, you know, Google self-driving car. There are actually so many amazing um, inventions and innovations in the biomechanical biomechanical field. So this is just one example. I also like this quote from the World Economic Forum report that basically says that one of the features of this fourth industrial revolution is that it does not change what we're doing, it changes us. And on the next slide, again, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but we have been living in this time that 
you know, various people have called, you know, disruptive innovations, creative destruction, and I don't think that's going to abate anytime soon. As a matter of fact, there is evidence that this is accelerating, and as it really continues to be pervasive and to touch every aspect of our lives, this is affecting, of course, all organizations across the board. And, you know, we all well know that the entire industries that used to be, you know, multi-trillion dollar industries have been, you know, wiped out, dramatically restructured or changed or replaced. Uh, music, uh, media, publishing, travel, um, you know, to a certain extent, retail. Um, and really the rules of engagement have been rewritten in terms of, you know, who can do what and who is entitled and, you know, all these uh, ideas of kind of firm and uh, spaces uh, that you know a company can can occupy have really been has really been challenged through the, the digital revolution, and also another thing that I always say is like this is not just about technology. It's certainly technology enabled, but it's really that we interact with each other and with the world so much differently today because of all this. Um, uh, with authority, with institutions, and uh, I would say that across the board there have been so many positives through this, and of course we all are aware of the darker sides that have to do with security and privacy, and I'm not going to really go into them, but that's a very, very important conversation. The pace of change is huge. Uh, it's, it's, it's really happening at the un unprecedented speed, and there is research on this. People are adopting various technologies uh, very rapidly and there is a constant both kind of convergence of the existing ones and the emergence of the new ones. And so when we look at, I mean for us that are in the charitable world, uh, when we look at uh, donors that are otherwise consumers in other, other areas of their lives, that the way they um, expect to engage with us today, uh, especially if they're younger or coming from the generations that are digital natives, it's really a lot different than the way that it happened a while ago. And I think we all kind of know this. And this is because the rest of their lives really sets norms around what to expect, right, and, and what their preferences are. And so they don't just come to us or to our websites and say, oh, now my norms are different. No, they're carrying the norms from the other apps and the other websites and the other experiences that they interact with. And for the large, for the most part, you know, this world today is a lot about user experience and user interface, and they will expect sort of the same level of sophistication and sleekness and transparency and speed and all of that. And so something that we call digital transformation is the path that I, I honestly feel that there is no choice. Every organization has to undertake it and, you know, to, to, to come to, uh, you know, some spot that is better fitting for the world that we live in and the world that is coming after a period of time because it's not going to be a slam dunk. I mean, it's, it's simply not a slam dunk for anyone. And I will share some uh, stats from the for-profit world on this uh, a little bit um, down in the deck. And so we talked about this. We know that technologies are scaling very fast from cloud to big data and analytics to blockchain technologies, virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and machine learning, which is very, very strong in Canada. We're actually a world leader in this area. Um, mobile and mobility, Internet of Things. And with all this really, again, comes uh, different um, different structure of, 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 you know, how we interact with each other. There is a certain what I would call like decentralization across the board, access to information, research, distribution of knowledge that simply, uh, you know, was not really possible before. And consumers are firmly in, uh, in charge. And, you know, I talked to a friend who is, um, who is, uh, uh, who works for, for a charity, and, and we talked about this, and I, and I said to her, I said, look, regardless of what you and I think and what we like or don't like, we're really not in charge. Like, this is driven by consumer preferences, and uh, this world is a lot about this expectation for seamless transitions between different devices, and, uh, you know, consumers or donors really want to be agnostic, and that actually has implications for charities as well. Um, another thing that I, uh, trend that I love to talk about, because I think this is one where charities do not take as much advantage as they should, 
uh, and they do not leverage an enormous potential that they all have is around content with the new um, technologies that really enable distribution of content uh, uh, from anyone to um, donors or, or, or readers or people is one that actually is the most, I think, significant in terms of uh, smaller charities today having access and, and leveling the playing field between them and, and the larger charities, for example, because today everyone can be a publisher, everyone can be a storyteller, and charities have an enormous um, content around interesting stories, inspiring stories, good stories, and this is one um, area where I often say, like, if you don't do anything else, like, really spend some time trying to figure this one out because you have an enormous asset in here that uh, often, you know, corporations are, are better at, at, or some other entities are better at doing because we haven't really spent enough time thinking about this. Um, social, I don't need to talk about this. We know that the social networks are huge, but more importantly with them, change in behavior around influence, reputation. Um, I'm now more influenced by my friends and what they say and what they think than by, you know, institutional research or what, you know, some somebody says. Like that has been firmly documented through, you know, many, many, many different um, research papers that, that we read. And then to me, really the most fascinating thing that has emerged out of the last, you know, few well, a decade, two decades, is this whole thing called person to person, right? The person to person that has really enabled um, a birth of entire new industries, the peer-to-peer -peer lending, the shopping, recommendations, and in our um, in our uh, case with in the charitable sector, crowdfunding and peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, right? And that has to do with a previous one that, again, is about influence among peers and really peers trusting each other more than they trust, you know, institutional um, research or authority. Um, one thing that I want to say on this page, because I think it's really, really, really important, and I really spend a lot of time thinking about how this is kind of more difficult in the charitable sector, is the uh, what I call the organizational impact of all of these, right? Because with with everything that we just shared, there is an impact on organizations, there, there is an impact on governance, there is an impact on decision making, there is an impact on, on your roles and emerging roles. Like 10 years ago, nobody had data scientists or data person, and now, I mean, at least in the for-profit sector, there are entire teams, and this has really become something that is a, is a must-have, like it's not even, you know, a choice anymore. Um, but, but but there is more on that kind of organizational side that I think it's uh, it's important to spend a little bit time talking about, and we'll talk about it in a in a bit. But I think especially with the charitable sector having the governance structure that it does, I think it will be particularly challenged to adopt its organizational strategies to this new world. Um, I'm not going to spend, um, I'm not going to talk about the data slide, but we'll just move on. I mean, the two things that I think, again, um, everyone knows, and I think, you know, there is some disagreement as to how fast this is happening. I mean, I'm seeing it happening really fast. Uh, the online giving is growing at a much faster pace than the overall giving. The overall giving is is flatlining. Uh, both in Canada and the United States, but we see that the online giving is growing, and it's also growing kind of in sync with the with the with the kind of how the e-commerce is growing relative to the overall retail volumes. Uh, so right now, it's I think between different studies peg it at between 8.5 and 10 percent of the overall fundraising revenue, and that's pretty much the same same stat for e-commerce. But what is more important that we see in a lot of research that donors prefer to give online, and not just millennials, not just younger ones, that when, then, then other uh, demographics as well, including baby boomers. So, I mean, I think this is the trend that is just uh, continuing to, um, to accelerate, and um, I think there will be a transitioning of uh, the donor acquisition, retention, engagement that will become complete. Again, it's not going to happen overnight, but I would definitely say in the next 10, 15, 15 years. And then I don't need to, you know, talk about mobile and mobility. It's just, it's just huge. It's huge in terms of how much volume is going through mobile devices, in terms of the web traffic and 
uh, mobile has actually overtaken the desktop when we look at the global research quite a few years ago. And, you know, again, there are, there are younger generations, millennials, of course, they prefer their smart devices. The uh, ubiquity of smart devices is huge, especially, I mean, Canada, I think, is in the top in the world. So this is all to say that prioritizing these two areas, of course, should be, um, should be of huge importance for any charity today. Now, moving on to the digital transformation, um, when I said in the beginning, let's talk about this a little bit and how to really understand it so that we can approach it uh, properly, is I see digital, digital transformation as really a holistic approach to integrating you know, digital strategies and digital technologies into the overall organization. And it should be strategic and intentional, not reactive. Um, I like this little quote from NetHope, which is an interesting nonprofit in the States that actually works in this area of uh, building the capacity in the non-for-profit sector for digital readiness and digital transformation. So they basically are saying this, is, this will demand that people change the way they work and I will say the way they think through processes and new technologies and really the way the world is being restructured. And I also want to say right now, and this is supported by lots of other articles that I read in um, uh, you know, the Harvard Business Reviews of this world and others, that this is really not about simply adopting technology into your existing processing. This is not about creating a website or uh, starting to send emails or having a database. I mean, technology enables these changes, but it's the transformation part that it's more interesting and more consequential here. And that is really about being able to think about opportunities that are presented to us today differently and to then be able to take advantage of them. And they could range from, you know, how do we, uh, you know, fundraising, like I said at the beginning, how do we engage with our donors uh, differently today to how can we be more effective as an organization? How can we learn better? How can our decision making be better supported? How can we capture our impact, right? So that's why it, it, it goes beyond. And um, I would also say that for digital transformation to even occur, you have to have something that is called digital strategy. There has to be something that is that is that is called well. This is this is the digital strategy for this organization, and the digital strategy has to be rooted in the overall strategy. And I'm a big advocate of strategy. That's what I studied in my graduate school. I noticed in the last again, a couple of decades that it's coinciding with all these changes that a lot of the kind of the, the art of strategy and this kind of longer term view has gotten, you know, all but forgotten because the older models of strategy with like a five year plans are just not relevant anymore. I mean, we all know that they, they're just not consonant with what's happening out there, but people don't have any alternative. So, Either I see that, you know, charities with their boards are still doing the typical kind of five-year strategic plan and, you know, some good work goes in there um, or it's not done. And I think there is a challenge for every organization is how do we think strategically and not become completely reactive in this day and age, but have a strategy that is fluid, is agile, it's, it's more loosely defined. Uh, and uh, that, that we can kind of keep alive, right? And I have a whole different, you know, seminar on that that maybe we can, we can do at some other time. I mean, definitely I would say that what's interesting to me as a, you know, someone who, you know, has been a, a student of, of different uh, frameworks of strategy and strategic thinking, the strategy today is also more challenging. Why? Because everybody has a different set of competitors because lines are, lines are blurring, blurring left, right, and center, right? So for charities, for example, today, well, now there are social enterprises, there are B corporations, there, there are corporations that have, you know, um, their own foundations and they want to do things differently. Uh, there are for-profit platforms like crowdfunding, GoFundMe, so they do their thing. The Facebook is in that, in that, in in sort of the business of raising donations as well, and or doing philanthropy, right? Like who who gets to do philanthropy? So the re the terms of references for strategic thinking have really expanded, I would say, across the board for everyone, and charities are not uh, exceptions here. Um, 
Another slide, again, I don't want to really spend too much time on this, but I want to make this, this point again. I, again, this is not just my point, this is something you very often read in, in various articles on this subject, is that organizational models and role designs today that we still have from, um, are really at odds with the scope of change, you know, the nature of change, the opportunity, the sort of disruption of the status quo, and, and the old models of organizations with, you know, more hierarchical systems of, of you know, based on the kind of old, um, the, the old world um, are, are not, are really poorly designed to take better opportunity to generate the change that uh, that would be relevant today, where we're talking about, you know, being flexible, being agile, being quick, acting fast. Um, uh, well, that's hard for charities, right? Because they have, you know, two, three, four board meetings a year, and for the most part, boards need to, you know, buy into more significant changes. So I, I see that that's, I mean, I, I don't really have a solution for that, but but I see that as a significant obstacle for more charities actually moving more quickly on, in some of these some of these areas. Um, just to demonstrate this idea that digital today is multi-dimensional and and in its potential really it, it is about more than just the external facing donors or customers in a for-profit. Um, for profit, there could be, uh, you know, here we see three things. We, we see donor customers, we donor touch points and uh, donor data and analytics capability, which is important with cross-channel experience, uh, um, unified data, understanding of donor behavior across different devices, ability to do some productive modeling, again, based on online technologies and the online tracking. Uh, so that's definitely one area. Then we have the operations and processes that, you know, have to do with communication and connectivity, with knowledge sharing inside the organization, transparency, data-driven decision-making. I mean, data today and all the data technologies and all the um, uh, apps and, and platforms really enable us to test our assumptions in a more significant way than ever before. So. It's like we don't have to guess anymore. We don't have to make assumptions. We have to make some assumptions, but they could be, what we can see today, it's so vastly more and deeper than what we could see 20 years ago. So what is the strategy for, you know, making sure that your decision making is actually data driven to the extent that it's possible? Um, work, workforce empowerment tools, again, this is a different workforce, uh, different demands, and again, um, you know, when I look at this internal part, it's really about, you know, how can we work uh, better together? How can we learn together? How can we be more effective? How can we be more efficient using the technologies that exist today? Uh, then we move on to the revenue models. And again, this could be about how do we transition current models to digital? This is something we did or I did as a magazine publisher where the subscriber acquisition was 100% offline, but then over the course of 10 years, it became almost 100% online, and it wasn't easy. What are the new opportunities? Often some of these new technologies actually bring completely new opportunities, and you have to kind of think a little bit out of the box to even see them, which is why learning how to ask different types of questions is very important as part of this kind of digital or transformation, transfor transformative efforts. Because at the end of the day, transformation is about creating a new set of kind of criteria and assumptions and, and a new paradigm, really. Um, and then there is innovation. I, I feel, honestly, that innovation is like super, super overused word. I, I, that's why I'm actually avoiding it. But there is something about this that I think uh, should be on everyone's agenda, which is that, uh, you know, how can we advance our impact through innovating on how we do things or how we approach things uh, today. Um, okay, we're doing a poll right now. Okay. Um, should I pause? I should pause? Okay. <laughs> I'm talking to Liz and Jen here. Um,
Nice. Okay. So I see here that um, a lot of people are saying we joined this webinar. Thank you, guys. Um, I hope I'm not going to disappoint you with this because, again, I think this is like a super, super complex topic. But um, and then encouragingly, 16% of people say that they have uh, that they have a digital strategy and have begun integrating it, which is amazing. Um, there is 6% that says we hired a consultant to tell us what to do. And that's interesting because I'll share a stat with you in a minute that it's interesting around. Uh, and we talked about it, but taking no action is about 16%. Yeah, that's, that's super interesting. Well, when we go on to the next slide, which is really about this holistic view, and I took this from a keynote that I did uh, a few years ago in a, in a for-profit space on, a, on, a, on digital strategy. But this is like how you can also look at, uh, you know, are you ready, right? Like what are, what, are the, what are the organizational and business or organizational areas that you need to kind of ask questions uh, in terms of, um, you know, are we ready and what are the gaps and, you know, where do we want to go? I mean, obviously, and I really emphasize this, and I think for charities this will be hard because it is hard for everyone. Um, human resources organizational strategy, you know, and that goes from, you know, do we have processes for this digital world? Uh, but more importantly, can we and have we hiring people with digital skills? Now, people with digital skills will be are highly sought after by just about everyone. So there will be a very uh, tough uh, uh, competition for talent. And I think, you know, charities need the same people that, uh, so, but, you know, of course we, our, our work is so meaningful and so exciting that um, at least here for Canada Helps, we, you know, we try to uh, lead with the mission and the importance of, of what we do. Uh, for charities today and so that's how we try to differentiate ourselves from somebody who can offer option or higher salary but I think this is a very important um, area. Uh, technology resources, you know, what is your technology infrastructure, uh, connectedness, uh, content strategy, I, I um, talked about this and this is actually put separately because content strategy is huge, it's huge in, in all sectors and I again feel that charities can shine here and that they have access to do this um, better than anyone. Um, channel strategy. Well, we now live in the world where consumers expect to do things where they are, right? So this is, you know, the Facebook fundraising because they're already doing other things there. Um, and this is really happening, this kind of uh, distribution of, of options to do things is, is really has been happening for a while. So what are you doing to be where donors are today, right? Or what's, you know, referred to as channel strategy. Data strategy, another dimension, as it's called here. Um, and this is a big one, right? It's, it's a big one. And what's really interesting to me is that the charitable sector has amazing data, and we don't have issues of ownership. Like the, the for-profit industries have data, but there is a very, you know, there are all sorts of things around it where they cannot just, like, put it to good use because, you know, somebody owns it and, and all these other issues. We have amazing data, but for the most part, I think the charitable uh, sector um, does not have a significant capacity to, um, to, uh, uh, to really uh, derive insights and benefits for themselves and for, you know, the country and for the donors and from the data, and I think government should have a role here, and I think there are some initiatives out there to kind of do this. But on a, on a level of your own organization, I think what's really important is to figure out what are you tracking and why are you tracking that? What are your key impact indicators? What are you, why does this matter? And I think then go to, okay, are we collecting this and, you know, are we storing it properly? Are we cleaning it? And how are we using this? I mean, there is definitely some work there uh, that uh, is important. We did, um, a few years ago, we did a data literacy seminars across Ontario, and they're really, really well attended. And, you know, we're thinking of maybe uh, doing it again, because I think this is one area that is kind of, it's very important to set up properly and to actually achieve some level of acumen and literacy before 
almost anything else gets done. Social business strategy, we talked about that a little bit, but we're now, you know, we've gone from social media to now social selling and finding, you know, donors and potential customers online, and again, there are lots of lots of um, uh, tools and, and platforms out there. Uh, the next slide is an interesting to me because it actually is from the NetHope as well because it really explains well what I was trying to get to, which is that in many ways this is not about technology, but it's about how to be, how to be today. And, and how to be is how to win in this digital era, right? So as important to me of whether somebody has, you know, IT infrastructure and, you know, is technically literate is how do you, um, how do you collaborate? How, what, what are your decision-making processes? Um, you know, are you entrepreneurial? Um, how are you adaptive? Are you, are you able to act quickly on the opportunities? So they have this notion of sort of the digital nonprofit and they put this up as a, and I quite, really like it as a more as a sort of this is the organizational competency profile and I like the culture matrix um, and that in this article they say and I really really agree that opportunities come from thinking and interaction first and foremost and the new kind of thinking the new kind of questions the new kind of questions start when you first start to look at which assumptions you have today about what you're doing what impact you're reaching that are unexamined or have not been examined for a while, but but I quite like this because it just it just it just shows how this is really not just about a set of technologies. The next slide is super interesting, and I don't want to discourage anyone here, but I read this in the just recently in the Harvard Business Review, and it really was fascinating to me because, of course, digital transformation was the number of concern. I mean, they interviewed I don't know how many CEOs in the for-profit sector. Uh, 700 or something and most of them said this is like a super important it's a number one concern um, but then the Harvard Business Review says st the staggering 70 percent of all digital transformation initiatives failed as you know was found in this survey and then they asked why right there are quite a few reasons but the top reasons uh, are lack of coherent business strategy to anchor the efforts and that's why I said at the beginning like it's really important to understand what is the framework of doing this. Um, the second one, over reliance on outside consultants and a mindset that one size will fit all and that's why I said this is not something that really in many ways has a beginning and an end. It's 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 kind of a new normal. The, the, being engaged in this process is a new normal and it's not something you start and then you finish six months from now. And this research really shows that. There is employees fear that the outcomes would potentially displace them, um, which is why it's so important to bring everyone along and to find a way to kind of collaborate and to create a shared frame of references and understanding of these projects when they when they get launched uh, in organizations. And then the final one, which I really agree with, but again, I feel that especially for charities, this will be hard with the governance model that we have with infrequent board meetings and really a huge asymmetry of information, maybe even reluctance to take any risk or that are so uh, characterize so many boards in this country. But it's the lack of a lack of this startup mentality, uh, yeah. agile decision making, rapid prototyping, flat structures. Uh, again, most organiza organizations hire his and you know layers of approval and slowness, frankly, are at odds with kind of you know the quick learning, the tweaking that has been you know the characteristic of our times. Um, you know what do I think? or do we think here at Canada Helps are the building blocks of an organizational you know, transformation mindset. I think first, it's amazing and it, I, would, I think it would already guarantee a much better outcome if you approach this as well as a culture change and not just technology, right? Improving your technology capacity. I think that's very powerful. Um, I personally believe that business as usual is an illusion. Of course, you know, in any mature sectors or spaces, be it a for-profit or not-for-profit, you always have a certain level of status quo entrenchment and, you know, 
people not believing that these changes are real and I was actually right there when I was a magazine publisher. Um, so I understand that completely and really it's not just about uh, implementing digital technologies. Again, I made this point a few times but I think it's an important one. Um, bringing people along. Another point that I want to make here, it, it has to be you know, we used to really think of digital as something that marketing people do. There is a marketing team and they're digital marketing and, you know, we have IT people and that's kind of, so there is this fragmented approach to this. That has gone, I mean, it has really gone in most of the kind of more progressive for-profit organizations. We cannot have silos and we also have to have people throughout the organization believing that this paradigm is important that learning new things and really embarking upon this path, even if it becomes messy and complex and ambiguous at times, is important for the future um, and having this shared view. But I think unless you see this as a priority, unless your board sees it as a priority, I don't know, uh, you know, I, I think things could be achieved and some results could be gotten. But if we're thinking about this as, you know, how do you become a 21st century entity that is fully, uh, you know, taking advantage of what's in front of us today and it's ready to engage with people where they are and where they will be, uh, we're, we're talking about a deeper, I think, a deeper process. And I think personally that boards across this country should see this as a priority and that they should invest into this process, right? It's, 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 it's something that I think has to be as well um, kind of mandated from the top. And I see somebody just did a, a study on the research and development investment in the charitable sector and it's really, really low. So I think for me, it's, it's always like, you know, what comes first, chicken or egg? We know the donors uh, that we have don't fund these types of things, they, they fund programs, but I sometimes feel that we need to push back and that we need to come up with ways to really pitch this to donors, to pitch the importance of this, and maybe it's that we haven't really, um, we haven't like formulated how to do this effectively, uh, to, to communicate how important this is for the future of our work in this country and I personally think that it's super, super important. Um, um, I think, um, you know, another thing that I want to make as a maybe my final point because it's really certainly <laughs> backed up by lots of my own experience is that I think there is a way to really not see this as like a massive plan that takes years to create but to start somewhere with the proper thinking about it and, and you know, board support and with some analysis of where you want to go, involvement of people and some kind of scanning of, you know, where you're at and really take it in phases and much like, you know, the agile approach and learn in action. When you are committed to learning in action, you're also committed to being honest about results and, uh, you know, being, you know, having the self-reflection around, um, you know, the learnings, the lessons. Failing is something that the charitable sector is completely adverse to. It's, it's, it's not okay to fail. We don't want to share that with our donors. But, you know, there is no learning without failing. There is no learning without failing. And then we don't share our learnings with each other, right, because we're afraid to publicize them. We're even afraid to to announce, uh, to acknowledge them, and I really think that's so wrong, right? And I think on some level that kind of has to start with each one, each and every one of us, that commitment to to be okay with failing and to understand that learning and sharing the lessons is important for this process, not just for our individual charity, but for the sector, for the charitable sector in Canada as a whole. And that really is a way to be agile yet strategic, right? Because we are all bombarded by so much information all the time and we for once here at Canada Helps, every day we're like, should we react to this? Should we do this? Somebody else is doing this. It's important to find a way to, to know how to respond, right? To, to know how to, to respond to new information and I think this is part of this learning cycle that, uh, that I think should be 
at the end of the day, really the underpinning of, of these types of efforts. And this is why this is about culture and learning, more so on a fundamental level than about the adoption of new technologies. Um, oh, we have a poll. Interesting. So, lots of people are saying, 62%, <clears throat> we don't have the in-house skills knowledge to take this on. 58%, um, no digital strategy. So, that would be a good place to go, to start. 22%, um, a lack of board understanding and support. So, this is not um, as big of a factor as I would have thought, that a board is just not there. Um, there is a staff resistance to change. Yeah, I'm not surprised by that. That's probably very universal everywhere. Uh, but the in-house skills and knowledge to take this on. So that's where I would say, I don't know how case gets made for the investment in this, but it has to be made, right? Okay, so I think this is a conclusion. We have a key takeaways uh, slide, but that will be uh, shared with you, and it's pretty much, um, I think, just a summation of some of the points I made throughout the, the deck. So I don't know if uh, we have questions, or um, I, hope, I hope this was um, at least a conversation starter uh, for many of you. All right, folks, we're just going to take a few questions. We'll give you a couple of minutes here. Just go into that questions log and type away, and we'll uh, be back in a couple of seconds. All right, so um, you can keep typing away with your questions there, but uh, we're going to answer a few right now. Um, so, Marina, the first question here is, can you share some incentives that alleviated cultural resistance to digital transformation? Sorry, I didn't hear that. It's the... Cultural resistance. Oh, that's the hardest question. <laughs> That's the hardest question. Um, whenever in my career I, I faced that, and I faced it many times, I personally went to the place of extreme sharing with people um, on, you know, the whys and, you know, what's at stake. And um, I really tried to run a very collaborative, very inclusive process of people putting their voices in and what I often found is that when you give people uh, an opportunity to have a, a voice in any decision-making process, even though they, of course, understand that, you know, what comes at the, out, at the other end may not be what they want 100%, but them being participants and particip being, being participants and participating and actually having their voices heard and also having the opportunity to understand what's going on and why um, has helped me in the past. Uh, even here at Canada Helps and we, we do that uh, very often. So that would be my formula. I mean some resistance cannot be um, it really cannot be addressed all the time. I think understanding the root and the root causes of resistance by having some sort of a process of, of you know, interviewing, uh, surveying uh, is, 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 
because it's often, you know, fear, it's, it's sometimes lack of understanding, um, could be a disagreement with the management or where they're going, but in all um, situations going through uh, these processes always yields um, learning and what I feel is a stronger organizational culture. Thank you, Marina. So we have a good question here. Could you speak more about the risks and rewards of going for outside consulting help when building a digital strategy or doing digital transformation work? Um, uh, outside consulting. Well, I, I feel and I certainly um, see a lot that charities, because they I mean, the, the use of consultants in the charitable world is, I would say, pretty high. Um, I understand why. It's easier to fundraise or to fund a consultant. And, I mean, there are lots of challenges around it, for sure, right? It's like the choice of the consultant. Is that the right person for you? Um, you know, how, how invested they are. So, I mean, all the cons are obvious, you know, they're going to come, they're going to leave, they're going to take their money. I think regardless of whether you're getting a consultant, doing some pre-work um, and creating, um, you know, a framework of goals and, and parameters would be important even before that person starts and also the, 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 the transfer of learning. So this is what I see all too often, and again, it's not just you know, it's not just in the in the charitable sector. But somebody comes, they do something, uh, it feels good, it sounds good, uh, it seems like the money, you know, there was a good value for our money. Then they leave, and literally after a, some time, the organization just defaults to some old method, right? Because not enough. I mean, I, you know, I'm a firm believer in that whatever you do on a business side has to be followed by some support for this to be integrated organizationally. And a lot of people skip through that step, right? So I would say, what are you doing to then, um, you know, assimilate uh, the learnings or the recommendations and to really also test them with your own staff. Another thing I wanted to say about strategy before, and this really has been documented in so, you know, so much research, is that we used to think about strategy as something that some consultant comes and does or executive team or board, and it was sort of the C-level office. They do strategy and the rest of the people do operations. That has been very much discredited, that whole view, where the operations and strategy have come closer together and the people who are out there doing the work in the field often actually have a more valuable insights um, into strategy and what needs to happen than the consultants the, who, who come and do their, their survey. So I'm a big fan of including actually running a process that includes as many voices as possible and this is this whole like 360 view that like nobody has all the answers today because the world is too complex, right? And certainly I don't think a CEO has all the answers or the board. I think this has to be, and, the, and, and a consultant as well, right? So they're just someone who comes in and contributes something, but it still has to be anchored in a framework and also the strategy of how to, to I, I personally think that, especially when it comes to these things, it's better to start from within the organization. There is a very <clears throat> poor rate of success of consultants, but again, I understand that that's often the only choice that charities have. Okay. So we have time for a couple more here. Um, here's a question about, in terms of beginning to help our board understand and prioritize digital strategy or um, our senior management, what would you say is the best place to start? Well, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting you do this, but I've gone to a, quite a few board meetings to talk about this, right? I think that's a good place. A good place is to start broad and basically establish a, case, establish a case that this is what the world is and this is where you need to go. And, I mean, there's just there's so much research. There is a lot of research on, you know, millennials and online giving and, all these things. So I would definitely say that at least my experience with boards that I presented to, um, they all were like, wow, 
like we kind of know about this, but we never as a group really sat down to think about this. And of course, there will be people who will say, I don't think this is as important. Or some will say, wow, this is, this is really important. But it's a conversation that you force. You can share this webinar with them. Um, we're going to shortly distribute a white paper that I wrote for a chapter in the book that is soon to be published on sort of how technologies are affecting fundraising, just even on that level, right? So, I mean, I feel that they, that you should share, um, you know, some of these papers and research, uh, bring speakers, uh, and then have that conversation, you know, how important is this for us? Where are we at, right? What's at stake here? There is a lot, I just see a question on further resources. There are lots of resources. I mean, I've been reading up on digital transformation a lot, like this is, and I've been thinking about it for a long time, but there is a lot out there. And there are some, you know, there are lots of kind of practical models and there, there are some different ones, right? So I encourage people to do further research as well. I mean, we can maybe send a few links or a few suggestions on the articles that I've read, um, but there is a lot out there. All right, thank you so much, Marina. Uh, I think we're gonna end it off there. Just wanna say thank you uh, to everybody for joining us and especially to Marina for sharing such valuable insights and helping charities understand what they can do in this digital age um, to, to transform in the sector. Um, so always thank you to our attendees for joining and remember if you have any questions at all beyond this, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to us and to stay updated on Canada Helps Leaders products or fundraising tips and webinars such as these, uh, be sure to follow us on Twitter at CharityLifeCA and subscribe to our email list. So from all of us here at Canada Helps, thank you and uh, we hope you have a pleasant day.